Thank you, James. Thanks for that uh, lovely introduction, uh, completely unexpected. Um, I'm glad he didn't say that I looked like a hun as opposed to uh, a knight in charming. I, that would be probably better. <laughs> um, well, uh, everyone, I just want to um, uh, first of all thank James for that lovely introduction and also the Center for Justice, Leadership, and Management, um, whose director is also here, Professor Steve Mastrovsky, who you'll hear from uh, later, and uh, as well as Jim Bierman from <clears throat> the U.S. Uh, Police Foundation, uh, who also helped contribute um, to this day uh, happening. And on behalf of the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy here at George Mason University, I also want to extend a warm welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for coming out on this cold day uh, to join uh, us for a day of discussion of evidence-based policing. And I hope very much that all of you will find something of interest, something challenging today. We're going to provide an advanced introduction to evidence-based uh, policing. Many of you know many of these topics already. Uh, so we hope to dig a little bit deeper into some of these topics. And for those of you who don't, we will provide introduction uh, for you. The uh, presentations will also be available, except for discussions, uh, will also be available online at our site uh, very shortly after. Um, all of our uh, uh, video production is done by Synthesis, and they're here today. For anybody who would like to uh, inquire about their services, they're fantastic. So um, uh, please do reach out to them. Um, today's training is part of the Matrix Demonstration Project. This is a uh, demonstration project through the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice, and it's uh, a project that, that we've developed here at the CBCP um, really to focus on collaborating with multiple agencies to think about how research can be uh, implemented in practice. Um, as many of you might imagine and are involved in right now, it's a very difficult task and so this is something that we are constantly working on uh, here at George Mason. And I'll be talking a little bit about the Matrix Demonstration Project today, but we have a whole website on it um, that's freely available for anybody to uh, download the demonstrations. Okay. So uh, this morning I'm going to start with an intro into evidence-based policing and my colleagues are going to delve into different areas of the evidence, different types of research, different things uh, that might have interest, uh, that might uh, have some interest to you. And uh, we're very fortunate today to have a number of uh, experts um, that I will introduce in turn when they give their presentations. But I just want to recognize them collectively. Our speakers are here. Uh, they have volunteered their time uh, today to uh, present their expertise to all of you. And so I very much appreciate um, their assistance. And I will introduce them in turn uh, when they give their presentations. And also just want to, uh, again, acknowledge our graduate assistants who helped make this possible. You can see them outside. Um, they're the ones handing you your uh, packets and your, your name tags. Today, the speakers and I have some collective goals that we hope to accomplish uh, with you. The first is really to disseminate as much knowledge as we can, and it's really just a small bit of uh, the knowledge and the evidence in the evidence-based policing world. But just to give you um, a, a flavor of some of the knowledge and also to give you uh, resources and tools where you can access this information uh, uh, easily. We also, uh, as a goal, have for you, because of the first and second line supervisory level uh, that's here today, uh, we also uh, hope that this will prepare you for promotion and advancement. I think a number of these topics are creeping quickly uh, into promotion and advancement interviews and tests. Um, and uh, often there's not a, a single place that you can find a lot of this information. So we hope some of this will, you'll find useful for that purpose. There will be a section in the um, uh, exchange today where you'll have a chance to ask questions and, and answers. Many of you, all of you should have received an index card. You know, please um, ask questions. Uh, please raise your hands if you want to ask questions, but if you don't feel comfortable about that, I would encourage you to write questions down on that index card. And we have a whole section just dedicated to question and answers. We'll have a panel up here of uh, practitioners um, who are speaking today, and we'll be happy to go through anything that you're uh, uh, curious about. 
Most importantly, I want everyone to at least be open to thinking about challenging existing models of policing. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to Chief Stevens about this, and uh, he said it very well, you know, that there's a lot of things that police do that may not necessarily be um, the best ways to go about uh, policing. And um, I think it's hard, not just in policing, but in academia, to, to change. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to think about what we're going to present to you today as kind of um, uh, some critical thinking around what are existing models of policing and what are some different types of models of policing that might be of interest. And finally, if you look in your workbooks, you can see a page that shows all the organizations represented here. Um, interestingly, we capped this off at 100, and we just, uh, just had an explosion of interest in this particular um, event. So uh, there are 170 of you here today, um, and so from all over uh, the United States. At least 10 agencies here are from outside the Maryland, D.C., and Virginia area. Thank you for coming all this way to uh, visit with us today and, and to listen um, and to engage with us. But I also want to encourage everyone to form uh, networks with those your colleagues who are in this room, because this is uh, um, really a good opportunity to meet folks from other, other places. OK, so to begin, why are we focused on first and second line supervisors? This is actually the first time the center has uh, done an event that specifically focuses in on first, second line supervisors. I know we also have some captains and commanders in the room. Um, but most of our events uh, have not. And uh, they're well attended, but they're often attended by chiefs and by uh, a high command in many police agencies. And I think a lot of the things that you're going to hear today are focus, uh, are discussed at places like ISCP and uh, PERF command meetings or at the Harvard executive session. Um, and it's just my view, but I think first and second line supervisors are often left out of this particular conversation about evidence-based policing, about innovations in policing. The problem with that is much of the successful implementation of many of these innovations happens at the operational level. It happens at the first and second line supervisory level. And so this is a, a disconnect between who's receiving this information and who's actually having to implement it. This uh, supervisory level also, in my view, has the most challenging um, uh, leadership efforts that have to be made for innovations to occur. You're often working with officers uh, and uh, supervisors who are not necessarily uh, receptive to change in many ways, and they might be suspicious of change because they've had to deal with it for many years. You know, all these new things are constantly being thrown at the police. So. Uh, to us, um, it's really important to reach out to this particular community uh, because you are the, those who will uh, be implementing a lot of these innovations or are being asked to implement a lot of these innovations. And I think the difficulty is especially true with evidence-based policing. <coughs> Why? Because evidence-based policing is very much um, a critical approach to policing. I, I don't mean that word in terms of a criticizing approach to policing. But it's a critical approach, and it often requires adjustments at the operational levels, at the level of patrol, investigations, analysis, um, intelligence, detective work. It's very much um, uh, focused in that area, and the evidence is mostly focused in that area. In fact, the crime control evidence that we have is mostly focused in patrol. Um, this is a problem on our end in terms of needing more uh, research in the investigative and specialized unit level. Um, but I, I think that uh, because of this issue of implementation, because of this issue of um, uh, evidence-based policing being um, uh, an approach that focuses on operations, that we really are, are pleased that um, all of you could join us today. OK, so having said that, what is evidence-based policing? And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, oh, uh, I should say, by the way, in your workbooks, under each tab, there's places for you to take notes. We have all the slides in this workbook. There is an extra reading, resources in the workbook uh, for each lecture, each tab that's going to happen today. 
Uh, so feel free to um, <laughs> write whatever you want in there. Uh, um, OK, but what is evidence-based policing? I'm going to start with the formal definition, and then I'm going to get into some nitty gritty uh, about the uh, definition of evidence-based policing. It's, it's really an approach to policing that incorporates systematic knowledge into daily decision making. As Larry Sherman wrote in 1998 in this <coughs> Ideas in American Policing piece for the Police Foundation, you know, police practices should be based on scientific evidence about what works best. And what Sherman was talking about was two types of evidence. One is uh, research evidence, evaluation evidence, scientifically derived knowledge and information about interventions, about the nature of crime, about aspects of the police organization. Sherman was also talking about a second leg of evidence-based policing, and that is assessment that is derived from within the police agency itself, using data that comes from the agency. I'm not talking about like CompStat data or statistic, uh, descriptive statistics. I'm talking about information like crime analysis, like survey information, intelligence information, stuff that even um, internal information about uh, the workings of the police department, the people that are taking sick leave, for example. It can be a wide variety of pieces of information. But evidence-based policing is not only about incorporating outside knowledge, outside scientific knowledge, but also internal knowledge. The key uh, theme between these two is systematically derived knowledge, scientifically derived knowledge, something that you can believe the outcomes of based on the process by which that information was processed. And uh, this is really opposed to a system in which policing might be focused, uh, uh, might um, uh, uh, make its decisions based on procedures or traditions or uh, consensus-based practices. Um, sometimes people use this term best practices. Um, it, it can have many different meanings. Okay? But it's this idea that it's juxtaposed against this type of uh, decision-making and policing. Uh, the flavor of the day type approach to policing, uh, even political interests, or even what a specific chief wants um, in terms of uh, uh, particular um, tactics or strategies. Evidence-based policing is not that. <laughs> it's something that really focuses on using systematic information and knowledge to make decisions. Now, it's part of a broader uh, kind of model of governance and crime policy more generally uh, that gets its ideas from relatively recent reforms in the medical field. And these, these reforms are, are such that something goes like this, you know, we shouldn't use medication just because our general practitioner says, well, you know, I used it on somebody yesterday and it, it worked for them, so here, you try it, right? It's not based on a clinical or an experiential form of knowledge, but it's based on this idea that if we're going to take a medication, then we at least need to have some assurance that somebody tested it that it's not going to harm us and it's going to help us achieve whatever outcome or a reduction in the illness that, that we have. Uh, and we do this uh, for a number of different reasons. We want to take medicine that has been tested and approved. Why? Because the medicine's effects have been scientifically tested and we know that it works. And very similarly in the criminal justice field, in the policing field, we have tests of different interventions these are not lab tests, they're not like ivory tower tests. These are tests done in police agencies about interventions and whether or not they, uh, they work. Some of them have nothing to do with crime control interventions. They can have things to do with officer health or things related to the organization or other types of interventions related to pretrial or evidence or um, uh, photo lineups, uh, DNA uh, testing. We want to take medicine that's been approved because these medical tests were tested on different people at diff in different places and uh, in different conditions that we can generalize from this information. Similarly, the evidence in policing has many generalizations which we can use uh, in different places. Also, because of the research, we know that a particular medication has a slim chance of harming you or we at least know what the harm is if it's going to harm you, all right? And very similarly, 
In criminal justice interventions, we now have knowledge about CJ interventions that cause harm, that don't have any effect on crime, that can increase recidivism or that can increase crime in a particular uh, area or among a population. Okay. But how else can I describe this evidence-based policing idea um, and, and philosophy? What's another way to look at it? And so um, I put up a couple pictures. This is actually some pictures of police officers from my old police department in Baltimore City. Uh, is that, it's not on the east side. It's on the, this is on the west side of Baltimore City. Um, I won't say anything negative about the west side of Baltimore City, just having been from the east side. Uh, I mean, they're cops, you know. <laughs> but the, the West Side cops here are um, uh, doing just everyday policing, right? Think of policing as, as the package, you know, um, just the everyday procedures related to policing, the incentives, the training, the tactics, the decisions that are being made, the technology that's being used, the information that's being ta uh, uh, tapped every day to, um, you know, look at people's records, et cetera, right? That's policing. There's this whole world of it, okay, related to procedures, arrest, et cetera. Sorry, academics, I don't have some sexy picture of academics doing anything <laughs> except looking and thinking. <laughs> um, but on the other side of the equation, you've got researchers, you've got academics, you've got an analyst who are generating um, uh, evaluation research, who are generating knowledge about crime, about crime places, et cetera. Okay? And these worlds are completely different. They're like, they have different incentive structures, they have different reward structures. They sometimes don't care about each other at all. They ignore each other, all right? These worlds are different. Evidence-based policing is about the process by which these two worlds mesh. And it's not just uh, the process, but it's about optimizing the relationship between the policing world and the research world to gain the most for whatever outcome that we are both seeking, whether it's crime control, prevention, whether it's improving police legitimacy, increasing, um, uh, uh, improving police relationships with citizens, et cetera, okay? So it's really about the process by which research, evaluation, analysis, and systematically derived knowledge becomes part of kind of everyday policing activities and results in some outcome. And of course, this is, is much easier said than done. Uh, this is a piece that I wrote for the Police Foundation uh, Ideas in American Policing lecture on translating uh, police research into practice. And in this piece, I said, look, I agree with Sherman. You know, we need to, scientific evidence uh, about what works best, very important, but that's easier said uh, than actually making that happen. What needs to happen for that to happen? Well, research has to be translated in some way. It has to be digestible for police. It has to be accessible in something, in some tool somewhere, uh, so police can look at it. It has to be filtered for the, for the, uh, uh, for the large amount of research that um, isn't necessarily high quality, right? So it has to be filtered in some way, and decisions have to be made about which research should be looked at, what research should be believed. It also means that policies and practices at least reflect crime prevention principles. Evidence-based policing doesn't mean that you guys have to go back to your home agencies and start up a, a, something that looks like a study that was done yesterday. That's not what evidence-based policing is. Sometimes research isn't even mentioned. It's that Strategies reflect principles that we know increase your likelihood of having an impact on whatever you're trying to achieve. Okay? That at least some decisions include and incorporate scientific processes and analyses, and that research is at least a part of the conversation of managerial meetings, et cetera. It's, it's currently not really a part of that conversation. Um, but at least that it needs to make its way somewhere in the discussion uh, that's happening in, in your management meetings. What do we mean when we say incorporating science into uh, practice? Well, let's go back to some of these pictures, um, and hopefully I can make my point this way. 
Evidence-based policing is not asking, are these officers following correct procedures? Did they respond quickly? Did they make an arrest? What are their statistics for today? How many citations did they hand out? Evidence-based policing is not asking that. It's asking something different. For example, see the officers walking foot, right? Evidence-based policing might say, well, is walking foot actually effective? Are they putting these officers in places that optimizes their use? If they walk foot in this particular area, will they have an impact compared to if they walk foot in this particular area? If we change the way they're walking foot, will they have more of an impact on uh, legitimacy as opposed to crime control in this particular area than that particular area? Okay. Another example, you see these officers with the, these papers in their hands, like they're doing knock and talks or like they're taking a, a community survey, right? The question might be, all right, where is that information going and how is that being used to then turn into some kind of uh, a further tactic or strategy that might be helpful to improving relationships between the police and the public? Is the survey that they're actually filling out valid? So once the uh, folks fill out the survey, can you actually get something useful from the survey? Are the questions valid? Is your sample valid? So when you come back with all these surveys, can you actually draw a generalization from this community to make a statement about what people think about the police? Okay. Another example at the, on the left-hand corner with your officers um, doing what might probably, probably some kind of special tactic in, uh, for New Year's. That's, uh, I think that's Commissioner Bealfield, like talking to them, um, uh, 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 talking to a group of officers. So the question is this, you know, is this tactic going to be effective? Are you going to assess whether or not this tactic was effective? Did this tactic cause harm within the community? Uh, did it actually lead to something? Let's say it wasn't effective. Are you willing to drop it? This is very difficult. It's hard to, it's easy to start a strategy. It's hard often to say, well, this doesn't work and we're going to not use it anymore okay, in policing. And finally, uh, the fourth picture that you see is uh, like a raid, right? There's actually a study that asks the question, is a raid on a drug house going to reduce crime and disorder on a street segment? Can anybody guess if it actually creates a deterrent effect? It does create a deterrent effect, but a very short-lived deterrent effect that decays very quickly in a matter of days. Okay? So the question from, from an evidence-based policing standpoint is, how do we maintain that deterrent effect? What kinds of things do we need to do? Or, or do we even need to do this type of intervention to maintain the type of deterrence, the type of crime prevention that we're trying to achieve in this particular uh, street segment? So it's a different way of thinking about all the same things that the police are, are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It focuses much less on reaction and procedures and much more on questioning uh, in a critical way um, uh, the uh, efficacy and the effectiveness of um, uh, interventions. Now, the question that uh, I think this brings us to is, is this the current model of policing? And I think a lot of research uh, while we see glimpses of this model in policing, we see specialized units. Um, I see uh, every day like highly motivated people, many of whom are in this room, uh, who do these things, who are trying to do these things in their agency. But the answer is pretty much no in terms of uh, is this the current model. Uh, why? Because the current model is very much dominated by what is referred to as a professional or a reactive, professional reactive model. And what is this model? Uh, this model has a heavy emphasis on procedures-based decision-making in deployment, investigations, and promotion. Uh, I, I mean, myself included, when I was in academy, we focused on studying this huge standard operating procedures manual. I mean, there, there's actually not, there was not a page in that manual focused on crime prevention at all. It was focused entirely on procedures, 500 some pages on procedures. Heavily focused on that. Supervision in the professional model is very reactive. It's also very passive. It's very much focused on ensuring that procedures are met and supervisors are tested in, for promotion on a lot on procedures. 
Much of it is surrounding a rapid response to calls for service. In fact, uh, 911, the 911 system, while uh, serving very good purposes, also creates a culture that creates this procedures-based, reactive approach, uh, professional policing approach. It's one in which a culture is derived that is very risk-averse. It's risk-averse to innovation. It's risk-averse to errors. It's risk-averse to um, failures, like if something doesn't work, nobody wants to talk about if, if something doesn't work, right? You want something to constantly work. There's an obsession with that. Um, and it's a, a vo it's a constant avoidance of errors, accidents, mistakes, and any deviation from uh, policies and procedures. And this particular uh, uh, um, era in policing that we're currently in is very much focused on arrest. Um, arrest is uh, a great reward for the police. It also still remains a major uh, performance measure for police today, clearance rates and things like this. Um, and officers and detectives are personally motivated. When we ask officers, you know, what, what makes you happy? Why, what makes your job satisfying? When I arrest somebody, when I, you know, catch some bad guy and arrest them. So I think it might be instructive, uh, given that we're not really as much in an evidence-based policing mode as I, I think we would want to be, uh, per se, or, or any of the other, other uh, models. It might be instructive to discuss evidence-based policing in terms of other types of policing, just to kind of round out the definition a little bit. You know, how does it fit? Uh, is evidence-based policing something new, or is it just another fad? Is it another model that's being thrown at police? Right now, you guys are dealing with um, a predictive policing model. Everybody says, oh, we got to do predictive policing, right? And in the past, there was community-oriented policing, problem-oriented policing, intelligence-led policing. You know, where does evidence-based policing fit in all these? Well, I think the answer is a little bit complicated. What are these really? These are just different approaches to the decision-making process of police that have been um, uh, introduced to police across the years. Community policing is a great example of this. It's an idea that procedures, rule of law, those are not enough to make decisions in policing. That we really need to incorporate in a democracy, we really need to incorporate a community input. Okay? And so within community policing, you also have a number of different types of tactics that have been associated with community policing. And there's a wide swath. I mean, foot patrol, community meetings, neighborhood watch, uh, 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 knock and talks, newsletters, a dare is associated with community policing. Same with problem-oriented policing. Problem-oriented policing actually is a scientific, is one type of scientific method when done correctly. Problem-oriented policing is this idea that we can no longer respond to individual calls for service anymore, that we have to see them as problems. We have to see groups of calls for service, groups of crimes, as pointing to similar problems. And in order to attack those problems, we have to not only scan, right? All of you know about Sarah, right? We have to scan, we have to analyze, we have to respond well. And we have to assess that response and be willing to give up that response if it wasn't useful. Right? So all of these things kind of reflect different decision-making approaches uh, to policing. Is evidence-based policing something new? The answer is no. <laughs> evidence-based policing does not reject or accept to any of these things. It's simply saying that if you are going to use a tactic in community policing, then be assured that it's actually going to lead to either reduction of fear, improving relations with the community, or whatever outcome that you're seeking. It doesn't mean, it doesn't reject any one of these things. It just simply question, questions it. A good example is problem-oriented policing. There's quite a bit in problem-oriented policing that is evidence-based, that has been tested and has been shown to be effective in reducing crime. But there are aspects of problem-oriented policing that if not done, kind of lose its vigor. One of the most important parts of, of the SARA model is that final A. It's the assessment. And oftentimes people do SAR, right, as opposed to SARA. Uh, they lose that final A in terms of the assessment portion. And that assessment portion is what makes problem-oriented policing more evidence-based. 
You can also use responses in problem solving that are not effective. Even though they're built off of, well, here's the pro here, I've identified the issue, I've identified the problem, you might use a, problem, a response that might not be useful. Okay? So evidence-based policing simply questions that. A good example is predictive policing. There currently is no test of whether or not predictive policing is effective in reducing crime. Okay? So to me, that's like a flag, right? <laughs> we have to think about, all right, well, how do we test this? How do we know? Is it something that's beneficial to the police? Can it help not only reduce crime, but can it also help change the way police officers think about their jobs? I think the jury is still out about predictive policing. And we can talk about that uh, uh, during the question and answer session. So uh, having said that, I, I think that there are many positive benefits of uh, taking on an evidence-based policing approach, which you can see here. Um, some of these, we do know that different tactics can reduce crime, that they can improve police legitimacy, that they can lead to accountability and outcomes. But I want to focus on the last one because it's the, one of the most important things to me as a former police officer. I think job satisfaction in any profession can be hampered by a reactive bureaucratic approach. It, it, it's um, a challenged by a reactive bureau, bureaucratic approach. Being creative, thinking critically, being involved in an organization, a learning organization, adaptivity, reducing fear of change or failure, experiencing proactive or transformational leadership as opposed to a constant reactive approach or a transactional approach to leadership, I think can improve uh, job satisfaction. And uh, in many ways, an evidence-based approach, because of its uh, nature, uh, because of its critical nature, is very much uh, kind of falls into these thinking outside the box type models than uh, the reactive bureaucratic approach. This gets us to the question of, well, what is the evidence? <laughs> you know, Cynthia, okay, we got it, but what is there evidence? And does evidence actually exist um, that we can use? The answer is absolutely evidence exists that you can use. Good quality evidence does exist. There are over 125, for example, there are over 125 good quality research studies that have evaluated police crime control evaluations. I'm going to focus on that today just because this is my area of expertise, but there are studies that are not focused on crime control that are also in this uh, research, uh, in this realm. There are studies that focus on police legitimacy, that look at the nature of crime and criminality, that study pretrial, diversion, probation, corrections. Okay? It's not just about crime control related to the police. All right? There are studies that look at situational crime prevention, SEPTED, et cetera. I'm just using the crime control uh, research as an example today. Um, and there's also one important caveat to remember regarding evidence-based policing, and that is not all evidence is equal. Okay? Some evidence is good, and some evidence is not so good. The goal in evidence-based policing is to be uh, swayed by better evidence than the not so good evidence, because the not so good evidence is uh, in, in a scientific, um, it's not as believable okay, in terms of the process by which that evidence was derived. Right? So part of our job uh, as uh, researchers is to sift through some of this and create something that can lead to uh, use, evidence being used. And that's what the matrix is about. I'm very sorry today I, I won't be able to get into the matrix in great detail. Uh, we have a whole training online. You can access it for free on our YouTube site that's uh, on the matrix itself. But I just want to introduce this as a tool that houses all of the crime control um, interventions that have been done that reach a certain level of methodological rigor. This does not have all the evidence base of policing, again. It's just focused on crime control. Um, but what I want to show you here is uh, uh, how we, brief, just briefly, how we came up with the evidence-based policing matrix. Um, the idea was really to bring all the research that reaches a certain scientific rigor into one place. And just briefly, um, you can click into the matrix. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to do this here. I'm, I'll, I'm really sorry if I won't. <coughs> Uh, 
But uh, uh, okay, yeah. So you'll uh, oh. Um, you'll be able to, uh, uh, you can do this on your phones actually if, if you have, uh, if you can take a picture of this QR code. But you can click into the matrix. Each one of these circles represents a study. You can see a very brief um, abstract of the study. You can also look at whole slabs of the matrix, like neighborhood, right? And see research that shows which tactics were shown as effective, which tactics did not show, uh, did not show effectiveness. Um, and which tactics backfired, which are some of these um, uh, red triangles in the individual section. Okay? And the matrix was derived by looking at um, three different dimensions of aspects of policing interventions. The target of the policing intervention, the con a continuum of level of reactivity versus proactivity, and whether the intervention was general or focused, more focused. Today I'm just going to give you the bottom line about these 125 studies. The three principles of good crime prevention uh, for uh, uh, crime control in policing. And this comes from like taking a look at the body of this 125 uh, pieces of um, uh, studies and making some generalizations from it. Again, this is very base. Um, it, please feel free to go into the matrix and look at some of the nitty gritty uh, within it. First. We now have overwhelming evidence that crime is highly concentrated. About 50% of all crime occurs in about 5% of your jurisdiction. And for those of you who are in suburban and rural jurisdictions, we think that concentration is even greater, not less. Okay, so 50% of your crime is occurring in probably less than 1% of all places in your jurisdiction. So we know crime is highly concentrated and we know, Dr. Coper will go into this uh, in his presentation on hotspots, but we know that when police change their deployment from random patrol to more focused on these places, they can have a significant impact on crime. Number two, officers are much more effective when, and this is probably, this is like a no-brainer. I'm sure all of you would say, yes, we, we understand this. You know, officers are much more effective in terms of crime reduction when they are proactive and not reactive. Proactive means anticipating crime, disorder, and other problems before they happen. This requires the use of crime analysis. This requires the use of understanding crime patterns as they appear geographically or within individuals, understanding hot individuals and hot times. Right? Jamie Rausch is, uh, from Jacksonville today is going to speak extensively on crime analysis and, uh, for supervisors. Uh, but crime analysis is very much a key point in uh, improving the proactivity of policing. And it also suggests, let me just make um, a suggestion, this also suggests flipping the way we think about patrol deployment. The most important time in patrol, the, the time that I like to call the golden time of patrol, is not the response to the 911 call. It's all that time in between the 911 calls. If police can reap that time, then you can have an impact on crime. That is the golden time of policing. But much of our focus in the professional model is not on that time. It's on the time of response to 911, individual 911 calls. And finally, because so much of law enforcement is procedures-based and arrest-oriented, much of it is also heavily focused on using tactics that are general in nature, that are not tailored uh, to particular problems. And this comes from uh, the procedures reactive based approach to policing. But yet we know when police devote significant resources to careful problem analysis and response implementation, that they can have a significant impact on crime control. And these include strategies where police partner with other people. So project safe neighborhoods, drug market initiatives, polling levers. Uh, these things have evidence behind them uh, of, being, uh, of, of being promising and creating crime control effects. So conclusion wise, when patrol officers reorient and detectives, when they reorient their activities to be more proactive, place based and tailored, they're much more likely to produce uh, a crime prevention effect. 
In order for them to do this, though, and this is the catch, this is the, the first and second line supervisor catch. In order for this to happen, they need supervisors who create the environment by which this actually happens. Um, they also need command level to be behind this as well, and technology, and all sorts of different things, training okay, uh, as well. But they, also, they need supervisors to create this environment uh, for this to happen. I'm just going to leave you with, uh, because I've run out of my time, so I'm going to leave you with some things that I think supervisors can do in an evidence-based mode to help with this process. Okay? I think the key thing in the, the evidence-based model is for supervisors to consider shifting from a more reactive, passive, and transactional mode of leadership to a more proactive, <clears throat> transformational, more active mode of leadership. And here's what I mean specifically for evidence-based policing. First, that supervisors are the translators at this level. They're the ones, you're the ones, that are able to disseminate information to your squads, to your um, officers. And in terms of helping the first line officers acquire this type of knowledge, I don't mean giving them a, a journal article to read. I mean taking the knowledge, for example, that came out of uh, number two and making that operational somehow in the ways that you guys know best. This is not our expertise. You know, we can develop the research, but in the ways you know best to turn them into operational um, uh, tactics. I don't think that officers are getting this in the academies necessarily or in in-service or in a field training, per se. It has to be on the job in many ways, at the, at the, currently, um, at this time. I think also, let me just run through this. I think also uh, refocusing your officers on the, the golden time of patrol, the time in between calls for service, reorienting orienting them to think of that time as the most important time in policing as opposed to the reacting time, as opposed to the arresting time as the most important part of policing is really key towards building an environment conducive to evidence-based policing. Trying out an evidence-based approach, hotspots policing, pulling levers, problem solving, situational crime prevention. You've got a uh, a number of studies to choose from to look at examples of what you might consider doing in patrol or investigations. Right now we're working with a big uh, agency on the western part of the United States where we've tried to encourage them to develop playbooks like, um, like in football, uh, keeping track of things that are effective so that other squads can use them, so that your squad can reuse the particular tactic that they uh, found was effective being willing to evaluate interventions and also remove interventions from the playbook when they are not effective. And also finally, redefining mentorship. Um, I had some great sergeants in Baltimore City uh, in, in that they were great mentors in that they knew the procedures and they could mentor me on those procedures. Okay? And I think that comes from a very professional, pro professional reactive model to policing. I think we need to redefine what we mean by mentorship. And part of that mentorship is about education, is about being uh, training officers to be more open to ideas uh, such as these. In your workbooks, I've got some other thoughts for you that I'll just leave for you to read. Um, I guess just a final thought that I'd like to leave you with, so you can go through this in your workbooks. But a, a final thought that I'd like to leave you with is this. Um, I do not think for a second uh, that science is the uh, panacea to policing. The research is going to solve all the problems that it can uh, help the police. I do not think that at all. Okay? However, I do know that it's not even at the table at the moment. And I also know that much of research provides information that can be helpful to the police if research is allowed to be at the table. Figuring out how to bring research to the table is uh, another matter. And that really requires really thinking about how to translate that research into kind of daily practices. 
supervisors are key to our understanding about how that translation actually works. Okay? It, they, you really are, because we are not operational folks. We're researchers. Okay? Understanding how the crime concentration statistic actually turns into a hotspots tactic is, is very possible. But we need that type of information as well. So I'm, I, I'd like to just leave you with that. And I want to turn the podium quickly over to Professor James Willis again, who's going to present on performance measures in policing. Uh, Professor Willis is the author of the 2013 Ideas in American Policing Lecture on the craft of policing. And, I, and this piece we included in your workbooks. It's a very important piece because it talks about exactly what I'm ending with, which is this idea of, all right, you've got the science, but how does this fit into kind of everyday uh, uh, things that the police value, things that you value? So James, uh, let me pull up your slide deck. I know.